Hey everyone, <laughs> great to see you. Hey Austin, hey Hans, a lot of familiar faces on there. Welcome to Wednesday VMR. Um, I am uh, Steph Sherman. I'm broadcasting from Houston today. Excited to discuss with Zavin, who's also in Houston, but a different physical locale. Uh, and excited to see everyone here. And we heard that Maddie has prepared um, not one, but two cases, kind of, I guess, sis sister cases, um, two different patients that um, I guess by their similarities and differences will enrich um, the discussion of whatever syndrome um, we'll be trying to solve. So uh, we'd love to have some people um, help us uh, help us think through the case who wants to participate more actively than um, than just a chat. How are y'all doing? What's new? Nilay and wow, long time. That's amazing. I we've been. Um, how are you? Hi, Zavin. I'm fine. Can you believe the first time we did this was like three and a half years ago? Well, I can't believe it's been a long, long time. I I joined residency in a month, so I'm in between uh, my MBBS degree, which is basically an MD in India, and my residency. Beautiful. Congratulations. Congrats. Congrats. And thanks for uh, um, volunteering to discuss with us. Anyone else? Yes, Shunya, we're very excited. Maddie's putting you right in. She knows you're going to be so good at this that doing scribing two cases at once is going to be is going to be uh, no problem. So thank you for being here and and uh, jumping in. Yeah, thank you. Well, um, yeah, we'll make it a we'll make it a full contact sport um, with everybody just in the chat and everything too. So. Um, um, as always, uh, unmute. And if you have something more to say than, than you feel like typing, um, jump right on in. Otherwise, Maddie, you want to take us away? Yes. All right. So um, I, as I mentioned briefly, kind of before the session started, so I know usually the format is to present one case, but I saw these two similar but different cases within like one week of each other on my sub eye. And I just thought the combination of cases had a lot of great learning. So I really want, I was excited to present them together. And I know that will be a challenge um, prescribing Shunya. So I really appreciate your kind of attitude to jump in on this, but um, I will help you as well. And we will do it together and it will be good. Um, so Shunya, you can go ahead and share your screen. Um, can you share your screen? Perfect. Maddie, did you, did you recently finish the sub eye? Yes, I did. Just about uh, two, uh, I had my sub eye, like my medicine floor sub eye, and then my MICU, and this is on my medicine floors one. Very cool. Congrats yeah. on doing those core rotations. Thank you. It was very exciting. All and right. We're yeah. thinking of this, like in real life, right? I We're never just working on one case at a time, right? And in reality, even very different cases that don't have the same symptoms, actually, um, I think it's both, of course, really hard to solve multiple cases at the same time. There's just so much clinical information and simply patient care to get done. But um, I think this is just going to resonate with experience. Hopefully all of you have had, which is like one patient often triggering something and opening up the case of another patient. So anyway, just kudos in advance for this format. <laughs> I'm excited. All right. Perfect. So I'm going to kind of do it. The format will be, I'll say something about patient A and then something about patient B. So um, there are two patients, both of them have a history of chronic lymphedema, and patient A is presenting with bilateral lower extremity swelling and redness, 
And patient B is presenting with unilateral lower extremity swelling and redness. And I will pause there. Nilayan, do you want to kick things off um, with some thoughts? And then I can jump in and Zavin, we can sort of alternate or jump in as you want to. Sure, absolutely. Uh, well, when I first hear of unilateral lower extremity swelling and redness in the context of lymphedema, my mind immediately jumps to cellulitis. It's literally kind of the first differential we have because lymphedema basically creates a milieu of nutrient uh, rich atmosphere, uh, nutrient rich milieu at a micro at a cellular level, and which is very conducive for my uh, microbiological and uh, microbial growth. Uh, apart from that, unilateral lower extremity swelling, is it in addition to the usual lymphedema? Uh, has the swelling really grown? Because the redness really in, uh, indicates some sort of inflammation, right? Uh, it's uh, rib, uh, rib color, uh, sort of uh, old standards and hallmarks of inflammation. And if there's inflammation, then we can uh, um, uh, deploy the IMID mnemonic. And IMID mnemonic in the context of uh, in, uh, in the context of lymphedema, the first differential really is is infection. Um, apart from that, uh, if we jump to patient number A, which is really the bilateral lower uh, extremity swelling, that's really interesting to handle because I read somewhere that uh, bilateral cellulitis is almost always the wrong uh, differential to make. But in the context of lymphedema, can it change or not? It will be an interesting thing to note. Uh, apart from that, in a bilateral lower extremity swelling, my first thought is always DVT, like, uh, especially uh, higher up. If this patient has been immobile for a long time, then DVT really makes sense. Uh, that's my really true sense. No, I love it. Picking apart both the medical history that these patients have of leg swelling in both legs, plus the new presentation of worse than swelling in one or other, I think is the right way to tackle this. Um, I am curious for the group, and I, I wasn't watching the chat closely, so this may have come up, like, how, how do people define lymphedema? Like when you see that in the electronic medical record, which is more often where I've seen it, I, I don't know I've, that I've had that many patients say, oh, I, I've had this lymphedema for a while. Like, what does that, what does that actually mean to people? Um, I'm just curious, was that in the chat at all, Zavin? Were you, um, or were there comments about what, what lymphedema is to begin with? A little bit. I would love to be on the same page about that too. Austin made the comment though that a lot of times when he hears that diagnostic label, as with many diagnostic labels, um, uh, it's not always the uh, the you know the, the, there's mimickers and there's things that can be labeled as such that aren't actually just pure lymphedema, um, unless it's somebody with known malignancy he mentioned and you know sort of known lymphatic disease. But um, so I, I actually asked the follow up question of. Um, well, if it's not lymphedema, what's what? What is it often that mimics it and that people kind of mislabel as lymphedema? But yeah, if somebody wants to kind of venture a definition of lymphedema, I'd love to hear it too. Yeah, lymph. I'm seeing here lymph node extraction, lymph extraction. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like it's the word lymph is in the name of the diagnosis and um, lymphedema, right? Technically means a problem in the lymphatic system with drainage of lymph. And very often that's because of uh, uh, an insult to the drainage system. Frequently that can happen. We're mentioning it in the context of cancer as a complication of uh, treatment for cancer. Radiation can cause lymphedema because of sort of fibrosis that happens of the lymphatic system. Um, tumors themselves can involve, of course, the lymph system and cause blockages and long-term buildup. And then I think, you know, many chemotherapies and surgeries, of course, can affect the lymph nodes, uh, lymphatic system also. So that's what lymphedema is. But the question is, um, is that actually what these patients have? Or is it chronic lower extremity swelling with a lot of the superficial outward changes that can happen, thickening of the skin with hyperkeratosis, 
uh, of course, enlargement of the legs. So Nalayan, just your whole question of what is the background even? I don't know if we'll get this more from Maddie before, but I, I've always, when I see lymphedema, I wonder what do they actually have? What's the reason behind their long-standing lower extremity swelling? Is it in fact a lymphatic system drainage problem? Or is it right long-term venous stasis? Is it high buildup with pressures in low extremity edema that's chronic for the many reasons we've discussed in other cases before? Um, so that's already just a question I have. And then Nelaine, I think you just had such a great approach to thinking about what could affect one leg versus both legs more than usual. And I think it comes down to one leg worsening should make us worry about a local problem in place. And you beautifully pointed out that lymphedema itself is a setup for change in skin integrity and thus development of cellulitis, which would be a great, very common explanation for it. Whereas worsening in both legs raises the question of, well, whatever the underlying process is driving the leg swelling, is that getting worse? Or again, is it one of those other systemic diagnoses? And I saw someone in the chat mentions those cardinal systems of renal, liver, and heart. Are processes actually going on there? Or is there a more proximal obstruction? So lymphedema, I'm, what I'm leaving with this alphabet with lymphedema, what is it in these patients? Is it a known lymphatic system disorder? or long-term lower extremity swelling for another reason. The patient with one leg, I think we're gonna zoom, zoom in quickly on a local problem and the person with both legs getting more swollen and red make us actually think both more um, proximally in the body and including in systemic disorders explaining why my, this might be worsening. All right. Brilliant discussion so far. So I will now. Oh, was that? Were you going to say something, Steph? Sorry. No, are you going to oh, hear me? Got it. So I'm going to give you. Um, I'll basically fill out the HPI and the past medical history for both patients, um, and give you the vitals, and then I'll pause there. So for patient A, so this is the patient with bilateral lower extremity swelling and redness. So she is an 87 year old woman who um, presented to the ED, really she was encouraged by her daughter because of this worsening, swelling, uh, pain and redness in both of her legs. So she said that she's had you know, chronic swelling in her legs for many, many years, but she feels that the swelling had worsened in the last several days with more pain. And because of this pain, and the worsening swelling, in her opinion, walking became more difficult. So for the past, um, you know, five days or so, she's really hasn't been walking much and mainly been um, sitting on the couch because of this difficulty walking with the kind of increased uh, swelling and pain. And as I said, it was really her kind of daughter who prompted her to come into the emergency department. Uh, in terms of res review of systems for this patient, she had no fevers, chills, night sweats, really nothing else bothering her, no chest pain, no shortness of breath, no shortness of breath when lying down, um, and no abdominal pain. Um, in terms of patient A's uh, past medical history, so as I mentioned, she has a past medical history of chronic lymphedema, um, which kind of the working diagnosis was that this was secondary to obesity. Um, she mentioned that she had had multiple episodes of cellulitis in the past. Other past medical history is she has a history of atrial fibrillation on Eliquis. She also has a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia. She had uh, coronary artery disease about 10 years ago um, and received stents. And she also has a history of hypothyroidism. Um, in terms of the medication, she's on the medications for those conditions. So she's on amlodipine, furosemide, losartan, um, aspirin, astatin, and Eliquis. Um, and then in terms of kind of brief social history, um, she was a former smoker about a pack per day, but quit about 15 years ago. Um, she retired, was a teacher, um, and she kind of lives alone at home. She uh, usually walks with a walker and is independent in her um, activities of daily living. But as I mentioned, because of this pain in her leg, she has not um, moved very much in the past um, about four or five days. So that's patient A. So that was the patient with the bilateral swelling. 
Um, so now to go to patient B with the unilateral swelling. So this was a 47 year old woman who woke up yesterday morning uh, with fevers and chills. And she noticed that her um, leg, left, left leg was red and more swollen. She denied any trauma to the area, but said that she really had a lot of pain. It was like a 10 out of 10 pain that she said in her left leg. Review of systems for her, she reported some subjective fevers. At home, she said she took her temperature and it was 104. She said she had um, chills and she had kind of night sweats that day before. In terms of past medical history for her, so like the first patient, she has chronic lymphedema that was also presumed to be secondary to obesity. And her other past medical history, she has hypertension, which she was on medications for. And she had something which I had never heard of called lupus erythematosus tumidus, um, which I looked up was kind of like a photosensitive form of cutaneous lupus. Um, and what else do I want to say for her? So um, in terms of the medication she's on, she's on the prednisone, prednisone for um, the lupus uh, tumidus. And then she's on furosemide and metoprolol. Um, so maybe I will pause there. And I know that was a lot of information on two people. So if I can help clarify anything, please uh, let me know. Sure. I'll, I'll try to dissect the case as much as I can. Uh, for patient B, I think this uh, picture is fairly simple. The page, uh, there is uh, evidence of local inflammation as well as a fever of 104 points towards maybe a systemic involvement as well. I would want to look out for sepsis, but for now I would label this as cellulitis. Uh, the fact that she has uh, night, uh, she has chills and uh, night sweats and fever of 104 makes me very, very worried about sepsis. And uh, I still don't know why she has these, this chronic lymphedema. So the chronicity of it makes me a bit less worried about the lymphedema part and more worried about the redness part because, as I mentioned, this patient could be septic. Uh, coming to patient number A, patient number A is very interesting because we have chronic lymphedema in bilateral lower limbs with a recent, on, or a recent onset redness. And as you mentioned, the patient is on amlodipin. Amlodipin is known to cause uh, leg uh, uh, swelling of the extremities. Uh, we usually give amlodipine in low doses or we pair it with ACE inhibitors to reduce the chances of those swellings. So it would be interesting to know if amlodipine had any role in it. Um, apart from that, I see patient number A. Oh, worsening. Oh, right. Patient number A had no uh, uh, history suggestive of heart failure, which was really my first intuition. And there's no history of any yellowing of skin, aka press or jaundice, which makes me really worried about the third component, and uh, which is kidney. There's also a possibility of her hypothyroidism getting worse, which could really ma uh, manifest as a myxedema, the or the orange skin appearance, which is usually uh, seen on the shin area. So to dissect these two apart, I would like to order a TSH T3 T4 to make sure that her, that her thyroid hypothyroid levels were uh, are right. Uh, 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 right uh, where they were before. And I would like to order a KFT as well, just to make sure that the uh, kidney is functioning properly. And that would be all from me. That was awesome, Nalayan. Um, Thavan, I can't tell if you're frozen or just pensive. Can anyone else tell? Yeah, it's unclear. <laughs> okay, he, he was frozen because he's gone. He'll be back. Um, the line, I think that was awesome. I think, um, yeah, my thoughts were kind of just revisiting, right, this whole question of what is this chronic leg swelling and possible lymphedema in these women. Um, we see the risk factor of obesity for both of them, um, which can predispose the lymphedema. But I think, um, Austin, you'd mentioned in the chat, like, really just venous insufficiency related to obesity is very common, but some of the actual lymphatic changes, particularly focal areas of lymphedema with very swollen specific areas can happen with obesity. So 
we have that. But what I like in the lion also is um, the older patient who's A, both older as an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease, but also has hypertension, atrial fibrillation with symptoms on both sides. The fact that you're quickly thinking about heart failure, which was yeah, epidemiologically, right, the most likely factor for this woman is really important and tying in also her medication of amlodipine as well as the hypothyroidism. We don't get any pattern of additional hypothyroid symptoms with what's going on now, but absolutely can can factor in. And then, yeah, spot on, this other lady, it's very, you know, same symptom, but more localized and a much more acute onset with inflammatory symptoms. Um, I think, again, cellulitis makes a lot of sense for her sudden pain and redness in that side also. Um, I may have missed an line, but just the prednisone itself, how does that factor in for the second patient for you? <clears throat> yeah, when I heard about prednisone, I was immediately very worried because she has a fever, right? She has a fever of 104 and she is on prednisone. So A, prednisone uh, suppresses the immune system. So fever shouldn't technically be that high. And if she has that high of fever, then how much would be her inflammation that it overpowers the prednisone? So yeah, really, really worried. Like what's happening. Yeah, great point. She's got a fever on a very strong antipyretic, so clearly is very inflamed. Zavin, I see you popped back in. Um, do you have other thoughts you want to add on this additional info? No, I have no idea how much of what I said the first time around was, was hurt or not, and it sounds like um, y'all y'all took over, so um, no. I'm good. Well, for the record, we heard nothing, but Maddie, why don't we take a little bit more, and then we'll um, then we'll well, then we'll get all your brilliant thoughts on it. How about that? Sorry, yeah. Y'all missed out. It was so good. So good. <laughs> CPS gold just lost because of a connection. No worries. Maddie, what else you got for us? All right. So um, I actually have photos of the, the legs, which I'll show you. And I'll, I'll first give vitals. Um, so for patient A with the bilateral lower extremity swelling and redness. So this patient was afebrile. The heart rate was 62. The blood pressure was 138 over 45 and satting 100% on room air. Respiratory rate was around 20. So for patient B with the unilateral swelling, uh, so the patient was febrile. The T max in the ED was 102.4 Fahrenheit. Her heart rate was um, in the 110s to the 120s. Um, she was satting 96% on room air and blood pressure. I actually don't have it written down here, but the blood pressure was within normal range as well as the respiratory rate. And I will now um, share my screen and I can share you, um, show you the photos. So, all right. Um, okay. Can you guys see this? Okay. Yeah. So this is patient a with the bilateral swelling and um, erythema that she had mentioned. And then patient, this is patient B. Um, and I can just say this was really kind of the dominant portion of the exam. The, you, the rest of the exam for both of the patients was unremarkable. So not, for both of them, the lungs were clear. There was no murmurs on cardiovascular exam, no JVP. Um, so this was really the dominant, the legs were kind of the dominant portion, uh, the physical exam for both. And I can also tell you both, um, that for both of them, the edema was non-pitting. So I can flip back and forth too, in case you guys have thoughts. Maddie, it sounded like the history for patient A is, you know, the worsening pain over several days is what brought her in. How painful, um, is patient B's leg? Yes, definitely. So patient B's leg is very tender on the left leg that you can see here. Very, very tender. So if you kind of, just, it was also warm to touch. Um, so the, the left hook here was significantly warm to touch compared to the right and was, was very tender. Thanks. And then I'd also say patients A's legs were um, also slightly tender, but definitely not as much as patient B. Uh, did the tenderness increase with the leg being in dependent position for patient A? Can you repeat that question for me? 
question uh, for the patient a did the tenderness in in her legs increase with her legs being in dependent position like hanging down i see i see that um that's a good question well i a way to answer that question is that when her legs were elevated she was more comfortable um i don't know if i explicitly asked her you know when your legs are down is that more painful but she um experienced like some relief having her legs elevated thank you Yeah. Um, do you guys want to comment on this at all, or I can give some initial labs? I can. I'd like to make a comment that you know. I, I think in my experience, um, the question we're grappling with, right, is is this infectious inflammation when you have like a red leg, right? Is it infectious inflammation, or is it non-infectious inflammation from uh, from edema, from tissue stretch, injury, damage, right? Um, and in some cases, um, part of the redness is also just just congestion more acutely in the setting of a DVT or something like that. And in my experience, you can have sterile inflammation that is very severe. It's very red. It's very tender. It's very warm. Uh, but it's just from a DVT. It's just from the acute venous kind of uh, hypertension, from heart failure, swelling, tissue stretch, injury, ouchie. Okay, so so I think what this um, uh, pair of cases demonstrates really well is to me the more helpful differentiators, um, which is bilaterality versus not. Um, someone made a comment along the way that, you know, if you do have baseline venous insufficiency and abnormal skin and you have a propensity for, for you know, cellulitis in both legs potentially, but it still would be quite a coincidence for both legs to develop cellulitis on the same day, right? Um, whereas both legs swelling more, um, you know, in the same week uh, are potentially more, um, you know, um, more, more likely. The other difference is the systemic symptoms. Um, the when you have a, a fever, leukocytosis, like just just um, tissue injury from from heart failure, I think is less likely to cause systemic inflammation like that. And then finally, the risk that people have already noticed, both in the patient developing cellulitis um, with the prednisone and immunocompromise, but also in us not treating cellulitis, even if there's a less than, you know, 100% chance of there being cellulitis. Um, so that's, that's what I'm taking away. Otherwise, like the legs don't look that different, right? Um, uh, it, it, one is more tender. And that's, that's important too, especially if um, you're kind of like surprised by how tender it is, um, you would worry about an even deeper infection. But Awesome. Um, should I move on? Please. Okay. Um, great. So let me just pick up where we left off. All right. So, um, all right. So let me jump into kind of some, some basic labs. So for the patient with, um, you know, this bilateral process, uh, so her CBC showed a white count of nine, a hemoglobin of 10.9, and platelets of 182. And her uh, BMP was overall unremarkable. Um, the patient with unilateral disease had a white count of 20 that was neutrophil predominant, a hemoglobin of 12.8, and platelets of 227. And her basic metabolic panel was also within normal limits. So for both of these patients, um, a duplex ultrasound was performed, which showed uh, no evidence of DVT in either lower extremity. Um, there was, especially for the patient with the um, bilateral disease, the, the kind of ultrasound read was that the bilateral calf veins were difficult to visualize because of the um, edema, but there was no DVT that was 
um, noted. Um, for, let's see, what else can I say here? Um, so duplex for both were negative and the, actually for the patient with bilateral disease, because of the history of kind of coronary artery disease, they got a pro BNP, which was 4,800. Um, that was followed up with an echo that showed an ejection fraction of 73%, um, no regional wall motion abnormalities, no valvular disease. Uh, so that's, I think, that's kind of all of the um, objective data that I have. I think the rest of the information that I have was kind of how the patients were treated and managed. And then I can share kind of what our working diagnoses were for, for both of them. Um, but I can maybe pause there. Just to confirm, uh, the patient with bilateral lower extremity swelling mm -hmm. had BNP of 4,800 with ejection fraction of 73%, right? Yes, that's exactly for the bilateral um, lower oh, extremity. With no valvular defects. Exactly. Yep. Thank you. I can add that to the whiteboard too. Um, okay, this is a very interesting case right now. We have a patient of bilateral lower extremity swelling uh, who endorses no shortness of breath, uh, no dyspnea, no dyspnea on exertion, and still has worsening bilateral lower limb edema uh, with a BNP of 4,800 and ejection fraction that perplexes me of 73%. Um, it's, it's funny because I was reading about heart failure a few days back and it uh, a very peculiar fact came to my attention that when a left ventricle fails, uh, the left ventricular end diastolic pressure rises. It leads to a rise in left atrial pressure, which leads to an increase in pulmonary, cap pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, which elicits a reflex called a heart failure reflex, which basically directly increases the left ventricular pressure. So a left ventricular failure causes the right ventricle to fail instantly. And that's why in a patient of heart failure, Edema almost always comes before dyspnea. That's somehow the gist of what I got. And only when the right ventricle pressure increases uh, and the uh, lymphatic fluids from the pleural spaces uh, cannot overcome that pressure, that first, uh, that secondary pleural effusion develops and then the pulmonary edema also. So this, I think, case is a perfect illustration of how we can have bilateral lower limb edema no dyspnea and the patient can still be in heart failure provided this patient is in heart failure. Uh, BNP of 4800, I think, should be very suggestive of that part. Uh, ejection fraction of 73% could just be hyperdynamic sort of heart failure. But this patient is not anemic. I'm not very sure of very, very. And the third cause I know is hyperthyroidism. So what is causing the heart failure in this patient? Uh, the patient did have a history of CAD. But ejection fraction of 73%, I don't know a way how to justify that in the context of heart failure. And the second patient, I think I would maintain my uh, uh, my line that the patient is probably septic and needs antibiotics ASAP. Yeah, Nalayan, fantastic discussion and just great review of the pressure buildup in heart failure and why symptoms might develop in one area before others. Um, I'm completely with you. I think the the clinical picture here in this older patient with cardiovascular risk factors and worsening of chronic lower extremity swelling with pain and redness on both sides speaks to, yeah, increased hydrostatic pressures in the legs. I'd probably go so far to say um, venous stasis dermatitis. That might be the non-infectious itis that she's experiencing in her legs. And the question is, why is it getting worse? And I think a new diagnosis of clinical diastolic heart failure fits very well for the reasons you said, Nalayan. Um, you mentioned really astutely in the beginning the amlodipine there. And I think an interesting thing I'll be curious to hear from Maddie is, um, you know, it's that's a, a side effect of that medication is going to be hard to rule out completely. I think there's different approaches to completely stopping that now versus treating for true 
intravascular and extravascular total body volume overload in this patient and seeing how she does. Um, but I think the amlodipine sort of hangs there still. But again, this woman's got, again, multiple risk factors for increased filling pressures in the heart being a reason for this. Um, and then, yeah, I don't think for the reasons both Zavin and Alliance said, we can at all withhold antibiotics. I think we, our working diagnosis in the second patient has to be cellulitis. And we have to think about what her risk factors are and, and pick the right antimicrobials for her. I'll say one thing about both patients is that if we did nothing for both of them for 24 hours, both of their pain, redness, and swelling the legs probably would get better. And um, that is just the function of hospitalization and being supine in bed with legs up. The complete lack of dependency of the legs for 24 hours is actually going to help these patients get better, regardless of whether we also give diuretics or antibiotics. So um, just an important important point, how much the elevation really matters. Maddie, you gave that interesting history point that, you know, for certainly the lady um, with the swollen legs definitely hurt more. They were, were hurt less when they're upwards and, and the symptoms themselves are going to get better with just elevation. And it's a great reminder that for cellulitis specifically, elevation and removing some of the kind of venous pressure is going to get some of those inflammatory symptoms better quickly, even before the antibiotics take effect on, on the likely culprit organism. So Avin, do you have other things to add um, at this point about kind of the potential diagnoses or management from here? Um, <clears throat> not really. I think um, the, the BNP is helpful. People are thinking about heart failure for the first patient. Um, uh, I think, yeah, it's, it's very much there. Um, I'm always just really curious what the, you know, venous pressures, the central venous pressures, right atrial pressures are. So if um, if it's a really difficult um, inspection e exam, um, uh, I like to just put put an ultrasound probe on the neck veins and actually find them and and see how high they go. Just because if you know if this if this lady's um, uh, JV pressures, RA pressures are actually like 15, 20, 30, then then it's that's that's a pretty pretty confident working diagnosis at that point. You're going to diurese them very aggressively and, and see how they respond. Amazing. I'm learning so much listening to listening to you all discuss this. So um, I can kind of talk through how um, our team was thinking about the case. So starting with well, let me just back up. So this is, as I mentioned at the beginning, so these were kind of two patients that were um, on my team and kind of assigned for me to follow like within the same week. And it was really interesting in that, um, you know, they were already admitted into the ED. And so our team was called to kind of like do the HPI and everything. And for both of these patients, the kind of, you know, summary we had gotten from the ED were that these two patients with, you know, chronic lymphedema, presenting with um, swelling and erythema kind of concerning for cellulitis. So there was kind of before I had seen the patient, it kind of um, the team had mentioned that there was a concern for cellulitis. And it was interesting when I saw this, when I saw both of these patients, because in my mind, the unilateral edema and swelling was much clearer cellulitis than the other one. But there was still concern among some teams, well, is there like bilateral cellulitis, which I had heard from many you know, BMRs and case discussions that um, that's very rare. So I think that's why I kind of wanted to present both of these cases together um, because of that. So for the bilateral swelling, um, really our kind of the working diagnosis there was basically kind of chronic lymphedema with venous stasis dermatitis. So had I mentioned in the history, um, the patient had been um, very sedentary for about the four or five days prior to her admission in the ED um, because of this kind of worsening swelling and pain and difficulty walking. So we were thinking that that were there was most of that redness. I can pull up the photo again. Was from this venous stasis dermatitis. There was thought to be maybe a component of kind of unilateral cellulitis on top of that. I can show you the photos again, but on the left leg on the lateral side, there was some redness. There was kind of more redness and tenderness. Um, so the patient was actually treated with um, antibiotics be um, because of that. So she was treated with um, 
cefazolin and then was transitioned to um, oral ceflexin. And, you know, looking back on that, I'm not sure. I'm, I still have a little bit of skepticism as to whether or not that patient really did have unilateral cellulitis, but um, that's kind of just how it, it played out. Um, but really kind of the working diagnosis was this chronic lipidema with venous stasis dermatitis with maybe a component of unilateral cellulitis, but much less obvious than the, the second patient whose di work diagnosis was um, unilateral cellulitis and was treated actually in a very similar way, was treated with um, cefazolin and then transitioned to PO Keflex. Um, and I kind of followed up on her chart and she's um, was followed up outpatient and is, has, is, in, is, much, is improving and feeling a lot better. Um, let's see. Um, I can kind of pause there. I had like a few, a few teaching points to highlight, but uh, that was a little bit of how the, the cases ended up. Awesome. Just such a relevant, relevant concern that patients come in with and that we evaluate for them um, at this time. Um, Nilayan, any just thoughts or reflections on, on your thinking approach to these cases? Yeah, I'm just trying to contrast these two cases and uh, I'm in such a wonderful way of highlighting the differences between unilateral and bilateral lower extremely swelling. Kudos. I mean, couldn't have been a better teaching opportunity than this. To your question, Maddie, of in a patient with venous stasis dermatitis, where one leg looks a little worse, how can you assess for concurrent infection or not? I've definitely been in that clinical scenario before. I think an uh, important historical question to ask is, is, is which leg is always a little more swollen than the other? Anatomically, the left leg is often more swollen than the right in most people, but if someone's had a cabbage and their right saphenous vein was taken out, their right so knowing a baseline, if there has been a bit of asymmetry chronically, asymmetry in the acute setting might be a helpful factor to say, okay, maybe there isn't a different process in these. It's just the chronic, slightly different disease manifesting in each leg is showing its way. So that can be a helpful factor to hold off on, on some of the um, additional antibiotics in that patient. Um, but it's it's hard, right? And it's, it's a really interesting... Um, discussion about just where people's treatment thresholds are to give antibiotics with a red or two red hot legs. And um, it's probably variable depending on the setting you're in as well as the general environment um, that you're in. Um, my one question for you um, before Zavin, we can, uh, or we can get some of your teaching and then it sounded like Zavin had some lymphatic thoughts for us is um, were any long-term medication major, medicine changes made for either patient? Yeah, that's a good question. I, um, to my understanding, no long-term medication changes were made. I, it's a really it's something that I was thinking of, and that you all mentioned was kind of the amlodipine and how that can contribute to edema. But it was it was really challenging to tease out exactly if that was contributing or not. So, to my understanding, that no long-term medications have been changed. Um, I've been meaning to kind of look back at their charts to see how things have been going, so um, I can check to see, but not to my knowledge. And I can actually share my screen one more time. I, um, on this PowerPoint, I was, I actually took, so this is the patient on like the first day. And then on the last day I took a photo and it was interesting that the patient was saying, oh my gosh, my legs feel so much better and they seem so much less swollen. And I don't know if it was just me, like I wasn't, <laughs> you know, I can compare. So this was kind of after, um, I think on the day of her discharge and just to kind of point out, so it was really this um, left lateral leg that was thought to maybe have a component of cellulitis. Again, it was kind of hard to tease out because with the venous stasis dermatitis, but as I mentioned, the patient was treated and this is how things looked um, on the day she was discharged. So I think I, I, as I mentioned, I wanted to kind of highlight these two cases because to me it was a very great example of how it's really hard to tease apart sometimes venous stasis and cellulitis. But a key warning for me was that bilateral cellulitis is really, really is rare. And so you should, if you're kind of invoking that, you should maybe um, stop and kind of uh, question maybe the, the, the thought process. 
Um, and it was good for me too, because I did some kind of reading on cellulitis. And so I just had like a few, a few points to share. Um, so um, it was good learning for me because I was learning that kind of most cellulitis is, are these staph or strep species. And um, if the cellulitis is purulent, it's more likely to be staph. And if it's non-purulent, it's more often um, strep. And so in this case, we were thinking that for the one with unilateral that was more clearly cellulitis, um, given the non-purulence appearance, we were most concerned for strep. And then as you guys talked about um, at the very first aliquot, you know, lymphedema is this kind of compromising condition that can increase the risk for cellulitis. And for both of these patients, they had had multiple episodes of cellulitis in the past. It's interesting, the, the one with unilateral cellulitis, she kind of came in and knew exactly what this was. Like she was telling our team like, yep, this is cellulitis. I've had this so many times before. I, you know, I woke up, I felt feverish, I felt chills. And like, I knew I had to come in and she was basically telling us what antibiotic to give because she had had so many experiences with this. So just to highlight that, just kind of the lymphedema can be this compromising condition. And to your question about what was the lymphedema from, the, the thought process was that this was secondary to obesity for both of the patients. Um, and yeah, I'll pause there. Zavin, I think we're itching to hear some deep thoughts on the deep lymphatic system. Um, that was awesome, Maddie. Thank you. Um, Okay, my uh, my deep thought is a, a silly sounding one first, and it's going to be the statement that all edema is lymphedema. What do I mean by that? Edema uh, is it is it third spacing, as in the fluid is in the third space? And that would be majorly lymphatic sign or edema is lymphedema. Yeah, pretty much that like extravasation happens all the time. And the only thing that clears fluid from the interstitial space, the, the third space, is your lymphatics. So even when you just have heart failure and you have, don't have any kind of lymphedema, any kind of lymph problems, the fact that you develop edema or pulmonary edema or ascites or anything basically means that the extravasation basically outpaced the lymphatic's ability to clear that stuff. Okay. So I'll, um, I want to show you all this um, uh, review paper that came out two years ago that I just like blew my mind in so many ways. Pathophysiology of the lymphatic system in patients with heart failure. And in fact, look at the first sentence of the abstract. The removal of interstitial fluid from the tissues is performed exclusively by the lymphatic system, kind of what I was just saying. Uh, tissue edema in uh, heart failure occurs only when the lymphatic system fails or is overrun by the fluid um, leaving the vascular space. And like some, something I learned from this paper, and I'm going to sort of shift over here and also show you all um, just the notes I took from it um, the first time I read it, is that like just how much of an active and like neglected system, the lymph. We learned about arteries, veins. Well, lymphatics is like the third set of highways that we just completely ignore. I had no idea that we all extravasate eight liters a day that our lymphatics clean up, right? And the maximum that they could clean up is even more than that. Um, in heart failure, right? Some people with heart failure have no leg swelling, even though they have very high right atrial and venous pressures. They're extravagating, extravasating but their lymphatics are just really good and they're just sucking it all up and not letting edema accumulate. Why does this matter, practically speaking? Um, I think it matters because it's, it's, it's helpful to realize that there's like two sides of the equation and that everything is multifactorial. So you could have like bad lymphatics, but on a good day where your filling pressures, venous pressures are not very high, you don't swell up. By contrast, you... Um, you know, if you have, if you don't have perfect lymphatics, it takes a lot less quote unquote heart failure or venous hypertension to suddenly actually, um, uh, you know, uh, swell up. Um, and then that sort of like multifactorial mindset approach also helps me to think about what to do in cases where like, okay, I'm not sure how much amlodipine is contributing, right? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but as y'all pointed out, like that, you know, the fact that the calcium channel blockers actually like kind of relax the capillary tightness and cause increased capillary permeability. Well, in someone with abnormal lymphatics, whether from obesity or something else, that might actually make a bigger difference. And even if it's not the whole part of the problem, it might be part of the problem where maybe if there's an easy solution, you don't have to, yeah, you don't have to like know for sure that it's the only thing in order to make, you know, try to modify what you can modify. Um, yeah. Um, and then the other thing I, that I like really had no idea about is the idea that you can actually do um, lymphangiosyntigraphy, essentially um, like imaging studies of lymphatic function um, in, in cases where you actually aren't sure what the diagnosis is or if there is lymphedema or not. So anyway, I can um, link the, um, uh, this, this article because I, I just, I thought it was so um, helpful for me um, as, as someone generally ignorant about, about this important body system. Um, but yeah, that's what I wanted to share. Thanks for the great teachings, Avin, and the awesome cases, Maddie, and great scribing, Shunya. Everything was completely up there and um, really easy to read. Do you, are you going to take us home with some final um, teaching point summary? Uh, actually, it's me. It's a uh, hey, Beatrice. Awesome. awesome. Thank you. And thank you all. And so, thank you, Maddie, for presenting two cases for the first time and thank you all Stephen and uh, Devin for discussing with us and so we started from the definition of lymphedema and we said that it's a problem in the lymphatic drainage that happens from an insult something is compressing it may be a tumor itself an answer to drugs radiation therapy and um, lymphedema may be primary or secondary secondary is uh, uh happens most of the times. And lymphedema does indeed increase chances of a cellulitis. And we have reflected on the swelling, so differentiating uh, between unilateral swelling and bilateral swelling. The unilateral may be um, more indicative of a local process. So for instance, cellulitis, especially if a patient presents erythema. Instead, a bilateral swelling is a, um, makes us think more of a systemic process. So um, we have also uh, underlined that immobility should be taken into account, so a chronic venous stasis. And in particular, chronic swelling lower extremities might come from a venous insufficiency, especially in an obese patient. And if we have fever, systemic involvement is more likely. Night sweats might, makes us think of uh, sepsis in this scenario. And the fact that our patient um, aim was presenting uh, hypertension, fibrillation, hypothyroidism in past medical history was taking and the pain um, made us worry of heart failure. And we've uh, stressed that uh, inflammation, we should differentiate between infectious inflammation versus stretch, injury damage, inflammation, and also steroid inflammation uh, since patient A was taking prednisone. And steroid inflammation might mm, induce also a deep venous thrombosis, hypertension, fever. And we've um, underlined that cell cellulitis, so the cellulitis management, uh, we should first uh, elevate, try to elevate our patient, remove venous pressure, and because in this way, we're likely see, uh, we would likely see um, an improved clinical picture even before antibiotics uh, start, uh, start um, having an effect. And um, we have concluded that in a patient with a history of chronic lymphedema, it may be challenging to assess whether uh, dermatitis is from venous stasis or cellulitis, but of course, bilateral, bilateral cellulitis is rarer. And we have reflected that cellulitis uh, maybe um, is a more uh, 
most likely from uh, staphylococcus or streptococcus uh, etiology. But if the cellulitis is purulent, it's uh, uh, more likely that it comes from staphylococcus, uh, where there, um, where it when it's non purulent, it's from streptococcus. And in the end, we have uh, uh, reflected on uh, it that uh, all edema in general, in the sense that exorcization happens all the time, and what clears these uh, excessive liquids are uh, the lymphatic system itself. And uh, uh, what happens in uh, heart failure when developing the edema, um, either in a pulmonary uh, way or in the situs, it's because the exorcization outpaces the drainage. And uh, we have reflected that daily, we do have uh, eight liters of liquid extravasation that is uh, drained uh, by the lymphatic system. And in general, when we are uh, confronted uh, with uh, the issue of uh, edema, we should think that everything is multifactorial. So we should uh, have uh, this multifactorial mindset, how much venous uh, and lymphatic and the drugs that the patient is taking is uh, contributing to this liquid access. And we have also uh, underlined that uh, we have a technique, uh, lymphangial scintigraphy, to assess how the lymphatic system is functioning. So thank you all for this brilliant session. And I hope you enjoyed the rest of the academy session that is happening in a couple of minutes. Thanks everyone. Appreciate you joining us. Have a great rest of the day. <clears throat> Bye.